just a moment right we uh, have started recording and today's assignment is a discussion of uh, the fakir of jangira now this is the website that i had referred to and i had uh, circulated to you as well now the fakir of jangira actually follows many of the traditions of the romantic uh, british orientalist uh, strain of poetry which uh, started off with the popularity of the arabian nights and the translations of arabian night into uh, nights into english this is the beginning of the 18th century we see the popularity in uh, johnson's rasselas in the middle of the century but by this time, the oriental tale had become a, a trope that was quite favorite of the literary <clears throat> personalities. Now, uh, interestingly, with the arrival of the Gothic, this entire trope of the oriental tale undergoes a certain, uh, let us say, mutation and uh, a transformation. So that there are certain very identifiable markers which are set. The first and foremost is the location in an exotic background. That's the first innovation which is uh, brought in. The, and very often this background is marked by what we'll call a combination of the picaresque, a picturesque and the sublime. For example, Jangira, uh, as uh, you will find out, is uh, on the outskirts of Bhagalpur near Munger. And uh, this is Bihar, where uh, De Rosio had gone to work for his uncle's uh, indigo factory. And he very often traversed the isolated banks of the river Ganges. Uh, and on the on the on the Ganges was the island of uh, Jangira, which was a rough, rocky, craggy island. And uh, there was no habitation only on the top of that hill. On that rocky hill was a resident of the mendicant Fakirs. So this is the isolated, picturesque, um, almost sublime beauty of uh, the exotic location. So that's the first uh, uh, feature, as I have projected on your screen. The second is a certain amount of supernatural happenings, uh, the evocation of fear, the evocation of strangeness and beauty. Now, in the Fakir of Jangira, there's nothing supernatural as such, but uh, it is sensation. And uh, within the exotic tale, there's this beautiful woman called Nalini, who is being taken uh, I'll just give you a run through of the story. The uh, the beautiful young widow, uh, almost a girl, uh, who's being taken to the funeral pyre. And you have the song of the widows who are celebrating the sati of Nalini. You have the song of the Brahmins who are chanting the hymns. The chief Brahmin priest who is performing the Surya Namaskara. And you have also the description of Nalini uh, riding the pyre, the funeral pyre, and is extremely puzzled by all this. But there's the suggestion that Nalini, even at this moment of crisis, is looking for her erstwhile lover, who was uh, the bandit of Jangira, the, uh, the bandit, the Muslim bandit of Jangira, as it were. So it's an interesting tale, which is introducing not only a Hindu custom, but also a personality from a different religion. And uh, at this point of time, and we, we, are, we are given an awareness that Nalini had loved the Fakir of the Jangira, and that at this point of time, he descends and uh, takes Nalini away by force from the Sati pyre. And both of them uh, exist in great harmony and great love on the foothills of Jangira. So uh, if not supernatural events, then you have uh, a reasonably 
um, you know, oriental tale of love between different religions, sensational uh, rescues from the Sati uh, pyre. You have extravagant events. You have characters, this young widow and the, uh, the romantic fakir, as it were, the bandit who ravages the territories uh, for the people. And you have uh, this, uh, you can say, effusion of romantic uh, love, where the, the fakir, in fact, announces that he can renounce Allah for Nalini. So all in all, it's a sensational story with a liberal dose of emotion, of love, of romance. And obviously, once again, you have the Hindu nobles approaching Dara Shuja and uh, an army being sent to hunt down the Fakir of Jangira. Ultimately, the Fakir dies in battle. But when dawn breaks out, you have uh, the vision of Nalini and the Fakir lying side by side, lifeless. So quite obviously, Nalini has given her life for her love. So this is the rubric of the tale. Within this, Dinozio has incorporated a separate segment called the Legend of the Sashan, right? And he spells it as S-H-U-S-H-A-N. So within the Legend of the Sashan, uh, Dinozio has in, uh, or incorporated the, as I said earlier, the tale of the Betal Pancho Bingshuti, uh, where uh, the king carries a ghost on his shoulder and the ghost asks a question which the king has to reply to. Now, this entire supernatural machinery is, as it were, or the tale is brought in to add to this convention of the romantic, exotic, oriental tale. Now, this gothic, romantic, oriental tale was obviously popularized by a lot of authors and poets. But very significantly, uh, De Rosio seems to have been greatly inspired by uh, both uh, Coleridge's Kubla Khan and Byron's uh, uh, poem, which uh, was published. Uh, let me give you uh, the, the exact uh, title here. You have uh, Byron's uh, sorry, darkness. Right, Byron's uh, poem on uh, on the on the on an Arabian tale. So there are quite obviously different Arabian uh, different kinds of Oriental tales that are provided. Uh, some are drawn from India. Some are drawn from the Middle East. And De Rosio is drawing upon his own experiences. And that is where, you know, a kind of Indian quality is being infused into what is the Oriental tale. Right. So this is fundamentally the background that I wanted to create before I moved into the Fakir of Jangira. Uh, let, me, let me see what De Rosio is also doing. But there is, as you can sense, a another dimension which is being brought into the poem because apart from the fact that it is a sensational, a sensational tale about love, romance, bandits, religion, it is also a tale about a woman and the sati. Now, quite obviously, one of the most important social issues of the period and De Rosio, as you have seen, being one of the most uh, articulate, radical intellectuals of the period, would have reacted to this treatment of the woman and the act of the sati. So we'll also take a look at the notes that he had sort of attached to the fakir of Jangira to see what De Rosio's approach to sati also was. So this is where I have created the context of the poem. Now let me uh, quickly take you through uh, some of the some of the sections of the text right uh Dinozio begins fakir of jangira segment 1.1 1 .1. uh if you just make a few notes uh in your just uh, whatever little scraps of paper that you are carrying so you exactly know which are the segments that i refer to if you note the first canto and the first segment 
Derosio says that this poem is about the hopes and the feelings which are linked forever with woman's soul. So interestingly, even though the poem is about the fakir of Jagira, and he becomes the uh, oriental uh, figure, in reality, Derosio seems to be probing into the character of Nalini, who becomes the center of the poem. So this poem is as much about an oriental tale as much about the suffering of women in Indian society. You, you see, one of you asked me this question again and then come back to it because it's so fundamental. What is Indian about Derosio? Is it just a subject matter or is it just the kind of uh, technique that he is using? I would say uh, very importantly that while uh, Derosio is talking about India's glorious past, and the, uh, the decrepit nature in which India has fallen. I think one of the most important markers for De Rosio is the state of women in Calcutta, especially in Hindu society, which needs revision. So there is a sympathy for the Indian woman that De Rosio is uh, very, very clearly articulating. And therefore, right at the beginning of the poem, you know, he's talked about India's great heritage being lost. And he's also uh, suggesting that the most important theme of the poem is the suffering of the woman, hopes and feelings which are linked forever with the woman's soul. That is the first point that I wanted to make, 1.1. 1 .1. Now, the next point that I would like to make would be with reference to 1.3. <coughs> and the creation of a topography, which the oriental tale uh, very obviously does. And you can see how deliberately De Rosio is trying to craft a kind of, uh, a kind of sublimity, a kind of uh, uh, exotics, exoticism, uh, this idea of the ruined solitary island with one single bil building, as surrounded by the wildness of nature. So very obviously, uh, while I say that De Rosio is bringing in ele Indian elements, this particular segment of the text is quite clearly an evocation of the Orientalist tradition of poetry, of the British exotic Oriental tradition. Where De Rosio probably is indigenizing it is not only the choice, but also in the sense that he's amalgamating this with uh, religion, with the deeper, with the shades of, you know, the presence of the Brahman in everything. But once again, let me quickly get back to uh, the notes that he had appended to Jangira's rocks are dark and deep. Uh, De Rosio suggests that, and this is the, the notes to the canto, notes to canto the first, and you can see uh, those lines once again quoted. And he said, I had one opportunity of seeing the beautiful and truly romantic spot. I had a view of the rocks from the opposite bank of the river. It struck me then as a place where achievements in love and arms might take place. And the double character I had heard of the fakir in, induced me to found a tale upon both these circumstances. The foliage he speaks of did not strike me, which in a subsequent part of the poem I have called bleak and bare. So uh, it is this topography that De Rosio squarely takes from his own experience, his own recollection of Sultan Ganj and the uh, presence of uh, the island of Jangira, the wildness, the ruins. So De Rosio is taking an orientalist tradition, but uh, grafting within it a very deliberate Indian uh, background. Although I would say it's this kind of a fuzzy liminal space in which the first in really long Indian poem in English is operating this once again, the, I, I harp on this word liminality, uh, this in-betweenness uh, of traditions. Now, I will later on send you uh, uh, an article which argues that 
Delosio's nationalism is very often uh, a kind of retrospectively placed in the sense that Delosio, what we know now know as nationalism was not there in Delosio. And that we have instead a kind of an East Indian cosmopolitanism, right? East Indian identity, which I explained earlier, and a cosmopolitanism in the sense that he's accepting from uh, all kinds of traditions, all kinds of tales. But I would argue that probably one of the important aspects of Indian English poetry has been this uh, has been this bridge between uh, nationalism on the one hand, the uh, the harping of an Indian identity and the usage of a language that is uh, really cosmopolitan and, if you want, taken from a colonial power. Now, many of you, of course, have already studied Kanthapura by Raja Rao. And you'll remember Raja Rao talking about uh, expressing a reality of one's own in a language that is not one's own. Right. Uh, now, even if at this point of time, 2021, we say that English is very much an Indian language, at this point of time, it was definitely not an Indian language. But De Rosio is trying to somewhere create this, this, this kind of a tradition where, you know, is accepting the East Indian as an Indian entity, and therefore, his language of articulation is caught between the British and the Indian. And placed within this liminal space, he's arguing for a tradition of Indian writing in English. Now, obviously, this is going to be a problem when Madhusudan starts writing, because De Rosio's language is English. He can't write in Bengali, if, even if he wants to. Although, as Lukki pointed out, there were people who uh, were uh, writing in transnational modes in, in Anthony Firingi, for example, who had accepted Bengali. But the new, the norm for the EU East Indian would have been to accept, uh, to accept English as his language of expression. And if he claims Indianness, then English becomes his own Indian language. So we're looking at a kind of English that is borrowing from the cosmopolitan, but trying to uh, somewhere adjust to the realities that are deeply uh, that are deeply Indian, right? So this is something which I uh, wanted to highlight to you: uh, the the topography and the liminality. Now I'll go on to one point five. One point five is the exoticism of the sati once again, and uh, let me quite quickly go through this. You'll have to give me this liberty of going to and fro the text. Now, uh, you, you see this snaking procession, and you have this colorful, almost pageant of people moving uh, through the topography. And he says, a glittering throng advanceth nigh with drum and gong and soldiery. The spears of gold in Surya's gleam reflect his splendor beam for beam. See, that's, a, that's that liminality that I'm talking about, uh, very clearly written in the uh, Anglicist, uh, I, I'm sorry, in the Oriental idiom, yet suddenly infringing and bringing in Indian realities, uh, Indian gods, as it were, references to the priests with triple thread, pronounce their golden god to play, please. And then you have this romantic figure of this woman with half face veiled, one lovely form is gliding there as if it were pure embodied air. With face half veiled, enrobed in white, she like a blessed child of light, amidst her ancient maidens seem to rise like Chandra in the jeweled skies. So the references to Surya and Chandra also are asking you certain things. You know, what is the readership of Derosio? Who is Derosio writing for? Is Derosio writing for a global audience? Or is Derosio publishing this specifically for Indian readers? readers? So that the Englishman who resided in India would immediately, uh, you know, realize what Derosio was talking about when he's referring to Surya and Chandra. 
Now, that's an interesting question also for the Indian readership, which would uh, his own students would later on recognize what is being taught about. But when Dirozio appends notes to the poems, then you see, once again, we come back to this debate of the kind of uh, language and references that Indian poets of this particular era also use. And they expect that to, to familiarize oneself with the context, the reader will engage in the process of going through the notes and understanding what the writer is talking about. So it is this kind of an appropriation in a contact zone where De Rosio is seeking to create within these asymmetrical power structures his own autoethnographic text, as it were, expressing himself in ways that are uh, creating a new tradition within the tradition of British Orientalist poetry, it's trying to carve an Indian niche, as it were. Right. So that is the 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 uh, the segment that I I wanted to talk about. Uh, and then if you just quickly move on to the next uh, segment, this is 1.6, and you have the chorus of the women. And you have what is interesting in the metrical structure is a sing-song rhythm of uh, the Indian song, as it were. So not only in subject matter, but also in the incantatory rhythm, in the metrical structure, De Rosio is seeking to imbibe an Indian tradition within uh, as much as possible the Indian language. Right. Happy, thrice happy, thus to live, earth and its sorrows for heaven and its bliss. Who that hath known at it parting would give, uh, grieve, quitting a world so disastrous as these. So you can sense a kind of incantation of the women who are wailing as they take this uh, young woman to the sati pyre. Uh, it's interesting in the experimentation with verse that De Rosio is seeking to do, is trying to imitate within the English language the incantatory tone of the, of the widows as it were. Right, I will take you to 1.9 now, and this is an interesting section, uh, which, uh, which I find very, very uh, crucial to the text. Uh, just give me a moment, please. 1.9. 1 1.9 1 uh, is De Rosio's commentary, as it were. Uh, and this is the chief Brahmin, 1.9, sorry, I'll go to 1.10. Just mark this, uh, this segment, 1.10. And then you see, suddenly the poet intervenes. Oh, this is but the world's unfeeling way to goad the victim that it will soon slay. And like a demon, it is its custom still to laugh at sorrow and then coldly kill. Ye who in fancy's vision view the fires, where the calm widow gloriously expires, and charmed behold her before she mounts the pile, her lip illumined by a radiant smile. And then talks about the suffering victim to the altar driven, and bid to hope for happiness in heaven, a heaven beyond the limits of her thought, a bliss her spirit never yet had sought. Now, this is the Derosio that comes through. This is the Derosio which ruthlessly criticizes the coldness and the killer instinct of custom that ravages this widow's dreams and her life. Right. And you see, those words, the toy that pleases but a passing hour, and uh, this entire decrying of religion, as it were, bid to hope for happiness in heaven, a heaven beyond the limits of her thought, a bliss her spirit yet never had sought. Now, 
I will come to this issue about Sati a little later on, probably at the end of the class, not right now because I'll be distracted. <laughs> but what is the point of the Fakir of Janghira? And what is the point of a British Orientalist tale? The point of the Oriental tale is to please, to evoke wonder, is to evoke a sense of awe and sublimity. But De Rosio's poem not only seeks to operate within the tradition, it is also seeking to offer a critique of the customs within Hindu society. And therefore, in this tale of love, as it were, De Rosio is seeking to bring in a very trenchant critique of, of Hindu society and its and the misery that it heaps on women. And that is why I pointed out in segment 1.1, the subject of this poem is not the Fakir of Jangira, but it is Nalini. And the, the wreckage that Nalini becomes and the, the, the wretchedness of the widow's life. So this is the point that I wanted to make to you. Now, if I move on to the next stanza, a next segment once again, and uh, he talks about this victim. She that lonely victim stands the while like a pale flower beside the funeral pile. And then he talks about this all that within her suffering bosom dwells, wild thoughts, wild things that we never can find. Save in a woman's wonder working mind. Thinkest thou she dreams of love and love for whom the parted dead departed, as it were, whose home should be the tomb? So De Rosio is asking within the poem the question about Nalini's agency. What has Nalini to say about this sati? Whom does she love? Does she want at all the woman? Uh, I'm sorry, the man for whom she commits the sati. So once again, while uh, while De Rosio is using the technique of the Orientalist tale, the rhythm, the, the sublimity, the exoticism, De Rosio is gradually working within this, within this tale, a kind of a deep uh, concern and sympathy for this young uh, woman and her suffering. So the point of the poem is not only to create sensation, the, to, not only to create an exotic tale of love uh, and uh, sensation, it is also to probe into the psychology and the condition of this young woman. Right. So I'll, I'll just uh, go on to section number one point. Uh, 13, I guess, I have already talked about 1.13. Now, let me just quickly move to 1.13. Uh, De Rosio is carrying on this, uh, this tradition once again. Ye mean, ye cruel, in whose bosoms cold, the thoughts spring idly, that love may be sold. What dare you bid our feelings all depart, and bid and give for golden dross the impassioned heart? Once again, this entire critique of uh, a male patriarchal society that is leaving the woman to die within the, the fires. And then uh, once again, you see how the focus will change to Nalini. Nalini's eye is not upon the dead. To one afar, her parting thoughts have fled. So now the tale is going to move towards her uh, love for the Fakir and her love uh, which is reciprocated in the Fakir's arrival and uh, taking her away in uh, the the and the, in the heat of the moment. Now let us uh, look at sixteen Fakir of Jangira one point thirteen fourteen. Sorry, give me a little bit of time here because we'll have to quickly move on to one point sixteen. Please mark, by the way, these passages which are important for you because this being such a long poem might be difficult for you to read through right if you take uh, 
this entire, you know, entire theme through. Alas, that women ever should be bowed to the earth with misery, and that her soul from pleasure's sky should like a meteor fall from high. Alas, that ever sound should flow of aught but bliss from woman's tongue, and sadder still that ever with woo her heart devoted should be wrung. But I almost sad when women, woman gay, must swan like sing her dying lay. So, you see, what I'm trying to suggest by continuously moving through this is the reiteration that Derosio makes of the miserable condition of women in Indian society. And that is where the Fakir of Jangira becomes a social political text, as it were, rather than simply an oriental tale. And Derosio brings his own experience within it. Right, I'll quickly move on to uh, now the 19th part of, uh, of the Fakir of Jangira 1.19. Uh, and you have the, sorry, this will be 29. And I'll have to go back to the Fakir of Jangira really. I'm sorry, please uh, excuse me. I, I'm having to sort of negotiate and sift through the text. This is 1.28. Oh, this is, sorry, not 2.8. Right, OK, let's just quite quickly uh, move on, because I can't uh, stop here. This is 22, 1.22, 1.22 it is. Right, this is the climactic dramatic moment where the sensational, you know, robbing of Nalini happens by the Fakir. The hark a voice in the thunder cries, redeem the unoffered sacrifice come like the tempest gathering on the crowd is broke the victim one quick through the thronging group they rushed as if a stream from mountain gushed or not while front wester from its cave broke loose in madness there to rave once again you you remember your coleridge and the woman with the dulcimar uh, this this entire passage of extravagant dramatic action is thrust by by Dinozio, but even within the sensational moment, look at that, look at that Norwester which is released. So Dirozio is actually drawing upon idioms and metaphors from his own identifiable Indian milieu and combining it with within the uh, the dramatic aspect of the the um, Oriental tale. So the holy bands in terror fly, the brave, the young, resisting die. The women weep, for in her fears, woman has nothing left but tears. Disorder reigns, the yell, the shout, the dying gasp, the groan, the rout. Alas, I have marred the solemn scene where late mysterious rites had been. But there Nalini's angel form beams like a rainbow in the storm. So this is the arrival. This is the climactic, dramatic moment of the arrival of the Fakir. Now let me quickly move on to one point. 25. 1.25. And you now have from the tale of the widow to the tale of uh, requited love, where Nalini and the Fakir, as it were, exist in bliss. Now, Jangira's craggy base is now beneath Nalini's silver feet. Right. And then you have this description, this very exotic description of the Fakir, the bandit, as it were, his dusky brow, his raven hair, his limbs of strength, his martial air, his eyes, though softened into the love, far from the mildness of the dove, his baldic, baldric round his manly waist, his sabre hung, his pistols braced. Bespeak him sure some bloody man, the chieftain of a robber clan, 
But whence came he, this certain here, a sainted soul, a mere fakir, on whom religion's sacred ray shines bright, hath dwelt for many a day. This is the saint, nay, can it be the holy man? Tis he, tis he. Now, there are, of course, allusions at this point to the sannyasi fakir rebellion that has broken out in Bengal at this point of time. And Dirozio must have been aware of these historical realities. You will remember that in Anandamot, Bonkim would later on fall back upon these accounts. So the fakir that he creates is not a religious man only, but a man who is marked by rebellion, a marked man who is marked by violence, fellow feeling towards his countrymen, and the capacity to love. Nalini, an iconoclast, a kind of a rebel once again, who is taking this entire uh, custom to, to shouts, to shreds, I'm sorry. So this is the, the portrayal of the fakir. Now, it is interesting uh, that uh, Dirozio is also using uh, the, the fakir's evocation of the Muslim religion. And this is a line which is quite, in fact, controversial in the sense that uh, 27, 2.2, uh, 2.17, I'm sorry, 2.17. Now, here comes a line where this is 2.17. Give me a moment, please. Well, well. 28. Point. Three point. Three point. Okay, I'm sorry, I I, uh, I can't really. 2.23. So, the, okay, this might be a different canto altogether. Uh, okay, I'll, let me read from this. Right, I, I am sorry, I, I, I've just misplaced this some, some, somehow. This is, okay, this is 2.2, a canto 1 rather. Not can to second. Please excuse my my bumbling with this twenty. This is seventeen one point one seven. This one point two seven. Yeah, finally I've got this. Hey, take a look at this line. Uh, the present signs so warm, so bright. This is the fakir speaking. As if our souls were dwellers fair, in days resplendence of light, orb of light, enjoying all the bliss that's here. And oh, if brightness more may be, the future beams so bright to me. No more to Mecca's hallowed shrine, shall wafted be a prayer of mine. No more shall dusky twilight's year for me a cry complaining here. Henceforth, I turn my willing knee from Allah, Prophet, heaven to thee. Now that is once again a very radical line in this, in this context. De Rosio being present in India would have known the sentiments exactly of not only his Hindu students, but also uh, staying at Lower Circular Road of uh, his Muslim neighbor. So when within this poem, he talks about moving away from Allah towards the cause of love and this entire overshadowing of love over religion, and simultaneously critiquing the Hindu religion for burning its daughters. There you can sense how the text emerges from a simple tale of oriental love to a very radical critique of 
organized convention religion, conventional religion, and Dedozio's argument that you know uh, one there's there's this 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 idea of the breaking free from these shackles of uh, society, as it were, and that love triumphs. In a sense, uh, Dedozio's use of this oriental tale of love is also to indicate that love triumphs over religion and that these norms uh, might be questioned within the text. So that is an interesting, interesting thought at this particular moment. Uh, <clears throat> now, I have, of course, talked about the Young Bengal movement and its uh, rebelliousness, its deliberate decrying of religion. There is no really uh, no uh, parallel within uh, the Muslim intelligentsia at this point of time. We do not have much education among Muslims at this point of time. Therefore, uh, Dirozio's argument that for the Fakir that, you know, Mecca or Allah is uh, not so important as my love for uh, Nalini and this possibility of a love across religions. Now, once again, uh, it, it might have been only possible for Derozio because uh, at this point of time to talk about love beyond religion is also something that is very radical within the poem. Uh, you can understand what kind of uh, a sensation this poem would have created at this point of time. Not only is it arguing about taking a woman out from the sati, but it is also talking about the possibility of love between uh, women, a, ma a man and a woman of a different religion. Right. So in that sense, the Fakir of Jangira has used an oriental tale, but it had turned it upside down. And this, this Turning it upside down is radical in terms of its content, but very subtle in terms of its usage of technique. Now, after this, you have the entire uh, idea that, you know, that the, that the Hindus rally around Darashujo and uh, the king also uh, submits to their demand that inter-religious marriage and the custom of sati has been violated, and therefore uh, you cannot, uh, the, the fakir cannot be tolerated. And you, of course, have the end where uh, the, the monarchy and the army uh, sort of tames the fakir, as it were, and kills him. And you have the final uh, segment where you have not only the fakir slain, but the morning dawned upon that sun-steeped plain. What saw the peasant, steed and rider slain? So this is the fakir, the rider and the horse. The chief, his eye was daunted by his by a form. Chief, his eye is the eye of the peasant. So bold in life, it might have ruled a storm. And fondly living around it were the arms of a fair woman whose all-powerful charms, even death had failed to conquer. Her lips seemed still parted by sweet breath as if she dreamed of him in her embrace. But they who thought that life was tenanting her breast and sought some answer from her heart to hush the doubt found that its eloquence had all burnt out. So it's a very sensational ending where Nalini actually has given her life for uh, the for the fakir, as it were, and this is a sensational and romantic end, quite in line with the with the Western romance tradition, which very often ends in uh, the dual death. But there's a slight problem here, uh, you know, when Derozio talks about uh, if this poem is indeed an anti-patriarchal poem, and this poem is talking about the suffering of woman. Then there are two moments of suicide in this text. One where Nalini is brought to the Sati Ghat so that she can be forcibly made to commit suicide. And this is a voluntary suicide that she makes to stay with her uh, lover. But you see, the point remains that 
you know, Didozio is suggesting that the woman herself has no agency at all. And that is, it is within the man's body that her, her identity is ultimately subsumed. Now, this is, I, I don't make this point with great uh, passion primarily because we also have to think of the context. For Nalini to have, uh, you know, stayed alive would merely have meant being carried back and taken to the Sati. So, uh, we'll have to remember the context in which Dirozio was writing his poem. But this suicide is also an act of, this particular suicide is also an act of rebellion in the sense that Nalini uh, chooses to give up her life rather than go back to her erstwhile Hindu society. So in a way, the Fakir and the Nalini, they carve out a niche, a space for their own of rebellion, which is beyond uh, society, as it were, which is beyond both Hindu and Muslim society. And therefore, this poem becomes, the Fakir of Jangira, therefore becomes a radical poem of revolt in the sense where love is used as a point of entry into a critique of social traditions, uh, into the expounding of the problems of women in Hindu society specifically, and therefore uh, becomes a trenchant political critique. Now, having said that, there are certain problems. What is the problem? The problem lies in the notes that uh, Dirozio had appended to the poem. Now, let me here take you through these notes. And this is where uh, he's talking about Sati. And uh, Dirozio writes, the whole of this passage has reference to a mistaken opinion, somewhat general in Europe, that the Hindu widow's burning herself with the corpse of her husband is an act of unparalleled magnanimity and devotion. To break those illusions which are pleasing to the mind seems to be a task which no one is thanked for performing. Nevertheless, he who does so serves the cause for the truth. Now, therefore, quite clearly, Dirozio sees Sati as a barbaric process and that any romantic associations with the Sati, according to him, is not only mistaken, it is, it is unfair and it is extremely, it only heightens the misery of the woman. So, the, this in, so Dirozio is also protesting against this romantic orientalist description of the Sati as this magnanimous sacrificing woman. Dirozio is rather pointing out that Sati is a barbaric process which is imposed upon the woman against her will. So far, from any display of enthusiastic affection, a Sati is a spectacle of misery. Now, you've seen uh, in our discussion of the earlier poem and where I took those references from texts, the word misery is the operative word here, right? And he says, melancholy reflection upon the tyranny of superstition and priestcraft. So that is what the poem is about then. The tyranny of superstition and priestcraft against which, you know, the Fakir of Jangira is a very, uh, is a very uh, stringent protest. The poor creatures who suffer from this inhuman right have but little notion of the heaven, which you've already seen, and the million years of uninterrupted happiness to which the spiritual guides take them to look forward. The most degrading and humiliating household offices must be performed by a Hindu widow. So once again, this is the internal critique that uh, De Rosio is providing, the critique that Raja Ramon Roy is also providing at this point of time, and Bidda Shagor will be doing subsequently. She's not allowed more food. She must sleep upon the bare earth and suffer indignities from the youngest members of the family. Now, <clears throat> but then comes a very problematic passage. Then comes this question as to whether this should be banned. Because this is the discourse that is happening at this point of time. Remember that, you know, whether Sati should actually be banned. This is a prevalent question that is being asked by Hindus. It's being asked by Christians. It's being asked by the government. What does Dirozio say about this? Uh, Dirozio, very interestingly, suggests that we are not advocates of 
concrimination of any doctrines of the superstitious Hindus. But as we are perfectly convinced of their right for the peace, peaceable enjoyment of this particular inhuman ceremony, we have ventured to submit our sentiments with candor and boldness. So after having made this protest, Dirozio suggests that Hindus have the right to this peaceable enjoyment of this particular though inhuman ceremony. Now, that is a paradox, isn't it? This liberal firebrand radical leader who infuses great enthusiasm amongst his students says that we, we can allow the Hindus to do this even if it is inhuman. Why does he say so? It is says, it is however our firm and sincere wish that the day may soon come when the rays of intellectual greatness will awaken the benighted natives of India from their long trance of bigotry and error. He says, I accept it is, it is barbaric. I accept that it causes only misery. But I also accept that it cannot be just over thrown overnight. Right. Why cannot be said overnight? Uh, can it be not thrown overnight? He says that, you know, just give me a moment. Every earthly persuasion was used. And he talks about one sati where uh, she was uh, she was tried to prevent from burning herself, but she committed the act. Now, the only point that uh, Dirozio makes is that the Europeans should not try to force this upon Indians because this becomes tyranny once again, ra the same tyranny which we are trying to protest against. Now, this is this is quite inexplicable in Dirozio. You see the logic. Dirozio is saying that we Europeans will be committing the same act of tyranny as the Hindus do if we forcibly impose a ban on the Hindus. Rather, it is through education that we must convince them that it is irrational and barbaric and that they should desist from it. Right. So at this point of time, within the notes that Derosio is providing, we are confused as to which Derosio is coming through. Is this the liberal Derosio, the radical Derosio, or this is this a pragmatic Derosio who really recognizes that a criminal ban on sati will probably not help. Now, this will be taken with me up in my next class when I will discuss Dirozio's poem on the abolition of sati, which was officially commissioned. And there Dirozio is very clear that Bentinck has proposed this act and therefore Bentinck is almost a god and he comes as a liberator for Indian women. There Dirozio is radical and absolutely on the side of the government. But this is a Dirozio who is suggesting that any violent act by the government might be tyrannical on the Hindus. And it is through education and gradual phasing out of Sati that a true liberation might come. So there are two Dirozios operating in this text, as it were. One Dirozio who is empathic, who is empathetic, rather, I'm sorry, who is empathetic towards the suffering and the misery of Nalini and the Indian widows. At the same time, and, and radical in terms of creating the possibility of a love between Nalini and the Fakir and the violation of the Sati. But in his notes, we have a more pragmatic Dirozio who is suggesting that, you know, uh, tyranny cannot be answered by tyranny and that it is only through education and gradual convincing by reason that the Hindus might renounce this barbaric custom. So I'm inviting you to go through the notes, to go through the poem. But I will not talk about Sati at large anymore today in the class. I'll just try to round off what I have tried to suggest through the 
very cursory study of the Fakir of Jangir. I'll obviously understand 2052 line poem. I've just taken segments from it according to my wish. If you want to, you can read this poem. It's it's in a in a in a way very interesting also because it talks about a moment in Indian history which is uh, quite dark and a poem which is pretty sensational. Now, my point in this text is that uh, De Rosio is working within a traditional of tradition of romantic oriental poetry. And his ideal seems to be Byron here and Byron's text, of which operates on exotic locations, picturesque natural settings, and a sensational events, romantic hero, elements of the romance, tragedy, and in general, a creation of a sublime atmosphere of fear and wonder. That is what the oriental romantic tale would have done. At the same time, it would have glorified the spirit of sacrifice, the sensational events that took place, including Sati. In fact, there are numerous pictures by Hodges where Sati is described and where Sati is actually in. These are prints which were sold dime by the dozen to Englishmen, and which showed the practice of Sati. Now, in De Rosio's poem, this entire, uh, this entire practice, this entire romantic uh, orientalist tale is deployed as a strategy of uh, representation. But within this romantic orientalist tale, De Rosio infuses his familiarity with the Indian religious theological ideas, provides us with an insight into the Hindu customs. It's not located only amidst names of Surya and, uh, and Chandra. You have detailed notes which talk about the conventions of Hindu theology. And De Rosio transforms this poem into a poem of protest where he talks about the consciousness of the Indian widow and the state of misery into which society throws him in. And it is in this act of love a cutting across religions that De Rosio provides a radical possibility of a movement away from this uh, from this entire uh, entire dogmatic imposition that society creates upon the individual in that sense the fakir of jangira is a triumph of the individual over social dogma and that is where i would suggest the romantic tale is turned inside out by de rosio at the same time the usage of the romantic lyric is Western, but there are subtle attempts by De Rosio, especially in the incantatory uh, passages, to graft in the rhythms of the Indian songs. But in the more you know, dispersed narrative structure of the poem, his description of topography, in his description of the events, is falling back upon the narrative technique of the oriental tale. So just as De Rosio himself did, this Fakir of Jangira, the poem, also straddles a liminal space, operating within the tradition of the British oriental tale, infusing Indian conditions, infusing the ideas and a graphic description of the misery heaped upon the Indian woman. And therefore, protest, sensation, wonder, romantic aspirations all merge within the structure 
of the fakir of jangira the question of sati is a problematic question altogether and i acknowledge this problematic within this particular uh, poem we find a dirosio who is more significantly pragmatic rather than rebellious but i'll read this entire debate once again with you when i read uh, his poem against sati uh, tomorrow with you right today i'll restrict myself to uh, merely the discussion of the fakir of jangira with that i think i will conclude today's section and stop the recording and then take your questions <laughs>